Hey, Tati here, and I am here with Alex Leanne Carter. She is a high performance productivity neuro coach, business mentor, and founder of Ambition Unleashed. She works with high achievers to master their millionaire mindset, supercharge their productivity, and up level their leadership skills so they can create a greater impact and hit seven figures without burnout. So I am so excited to have you here. Can you let us know more about yourself and what got you into doing this work? Yeah, Tati. Well, thank you so much for having me and to the audience for listening today. So, you know, high achiever, high performer, like, you know, I'm sure many of your listeners, um, you know, from the outside, it looked like I was a great success. I had this beautiful role of being a director of educational technology, but yet, you know, despite all sort of the success on the outside, I still found myself down this path of burnout, um, you know, and it really almost took, it was like, a slow journey almost in a way, right? And I would identify things that would come up and I would try to course correct and like self heal myself. Uh, but it was like, despite all the things that I did, I still found myself heading down a path to burnout and completely burnt out in the fall of 2019. And after that burnout, it kind of started this journey of a little bit of self discovery, you know, learning about what it means to be a high achiever, all the things that sometimes stand in our way and, and why I was experiencing such a debilitating anxiety, you know, why I would experience, you know, periods of depression. And it was really what it came down to was really the thoughts that were going on in my mind that I had no idea that were running on autopilot that actually led me to this burnout. So um, after then I started, you know, on a, on a quest to kind of, you know, heal myself and get myself better, uh, especially since, you know, after when I reached the burnout, all I wanted was to be motivated again. I wanted to be myself again, like the high vibe, you know, passionate lady that I was. And uh, it led me down this path of this journey to become a certified neuro coach and now working, coaching other female high achievers, like I know you do yourself, um, to help them and support them and, and be able to really, you know, live the life to the fullest and be able to live a life that we want to be living and follow our passions and our dreams without having to end up working like overworked and over, you know, overwhelmed and really burnt out in this process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's an inspiring story. And you had mentioned that you got to that point of burnout in 2019. So for you, were there any warning signs? Like, was this something that happened gradually over time? Or was there a point where you realized like, this is too much and I have to make a change? It's, you know, it's interesting, because there were a couple of like moments on the journey, but it wasn't until like that actual burnout that I kind of seeked more help. Like, before that, I kind of did things on my own. So, you know, as far back as even 2015, um, I, I was waking up with uh, panic attacks. I didn't realize there were panic attacks the, at that point. I, I thought I was actually having a heart attack. So I did actually go see doctors and, and have all these tests done. And I remember hearing the doctor talk to the nurse in the, in the hallway outside of the, the room. And I heard him saying, oh, it's just all in her head. Now, at that moment in time, you know, I think this is like pre where there was a lot of discussion around mental health. And so when I heard that, I was really, really offended that he kind of said mm -hmm. that. And he just came back into me and says, no, you're perfectly fine. And I was like, how am I perfectly fine? Like, I literally am waking up in the middle of the night with these sweats. My heart is pounding. Like, I feel like there's something wrong with me. You know, I find myself, I think, you know, if when I would get overwhelmed, I couldn't even breathe sometimes. But yet, it was like inconclusive. I kind of just went on and just accepted that this is just how it is. Um, I had Friday nights, you know, in the middle of a busy restaurant, I would be falling asleep. My body was just so exhausted with, I think, fighting and, and kind of pushing against all the internal that was going on inside of me, just being a high achiever, you just, you just push through, you kind of just accept it and like, and, and move forward. Then in 2017, I, due to stress and anxiety, I, you know, fainted at work. So I, you know, was at home and realized, you know, again, because anxiety I was experiencing, um, you know, started to dive into health and nutrition and, and did all that. And it was like, despite all of the, my best efforts, you know, to work on mindset and do the morning routine and, and follow all of the, the, you know, the, the help, the self help tips, I still led to the burnout piece in 2019. And I think the, the shift became when I actually seeked help I just had the story of I can do it all by myself and I was too proud to ask for help. And you know, it was a lot of the stories that I think a lot of female high achievers experience wanting to prove everybody wrong and that we can do it all on our own. And I didn't want to look weak for asking for help. And so 
yeah, until it got to the point where I hit that burnout and, and the hit kind of sort of hit rock bottom. And at that point I, I, you know, seeked help, you know, started working with therapists and, and even a psychiatrist and started to learn about what I was experiencing and why I had this anxiety, even to admit that I had anxiety. I, I was ashamed to do that. I wouldn't even admit that I had the anxiety. I just thought it was like, it's just who I am. And I just have to accept it. And, and yet I would find myself like, you know, um, waking up or looking at myself in the mirror too. And being like, am I really going to be feeling this roller coaster of emotion the rest of my life? Like I'm tired, I'm exhausted. And I got very close at very, um, at a variety of, of moments where I'm like, you know, do I go on medication? You know, do I, do I seek help? But yet the determined like woman inside of me was just like, no, I can do it on my own. I can do it on my own. So I just kept searching and trying different things to be able to, to relieve that pressure and anxiety on my own until, until the burnout piece cat happened. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So it sounds like you really had a long journey. And I think what you are describing that your experience was, is actually pretty common, you know, because a lot of the symptoms of anxiety are physical. I think a lot of people don't necessarily realize that it could be a mental health struggle. And like you were saying, you thought you were having a heart attack and because it feels so real and so scary. Um, and you also discussed just that journey of like difficulty and asking for help. And, and I think as a high achiever, like you're saying, that, that can be tough to ask for help and, and want to seek out support because you don't want to be perceived as weak. But I, I really think that it requires a lot of courage to ask for help and to realize that you can't do it on your own. You know, I think this is the case for anybody um, and anybody who's listening that, you know, it's not a sign of weakness to, to ask for help. Well, I think it's, it's a sign of strength, right. To to see that, but I think it's just the society, it's a society and, and what it looks like right on the outside. And that's what I learned about, you know, I had no idea when I started learning about like what was causing the anxiety, like the cognitive behavioral therapy, the CBT I started and started to learn about, yeah, I mean, the influences and, and almost the stories that we kind of make up in our minds because of what we see outside of it outside of us, right? And we look at, we look at social media, and we look at, I mean, even the education system, and I have a background in education, and I can even take a step back and say, like, you know, are we really setting our children up for success and our students up for success, right? When it is about, like, all the learning outcomes and, and all these assessments and, and looking back, the stories around we need to work hard to be successful and, and, and just the environmental factor. I think for women as well, when we look back at history, and even the role that women played in history. And then we start to work and have, you know, our, our mother had and our, you know, the, the job had, and, and then we're trying to find this balance and we're trying to be everything to everybody. And we have this caring na- nature. And then we just, yeah, find ourselves saying yes to so many things and wanting to show, especially, you know, depending on where you're working. I mean, even though when I was in education, I was working in technology. So I still worked with a lot of men and trying to prove them that guess what I could do it just as good as they could, or, you know, earning the respect of that. And, um, I've been learning a lot in this journey about how, you know, the, this whole, the whole masculine piece, right. So about getting more done and, you know, productivity about the checklist is very, this masculine piece. And as women, we need time for that rest and we need time for the pause and we need time for all of that, which can be very challenging. And again, if that story, I think for myself, I always remember thinking, well, I don't have time to rest because what are, whatever, what's everyone else going to be thinking of me, right? If I take time to recharge and, and learning and realizing through this recovery of burnout, that all of these stories are the things I, I believed was what really led to this path of burnout. And in order to recover from the path to burnout, I think it takes that, that shift and seeing things differently and embracing some of the the, the femininity um, and that energy piece and, and absorbing it. And of course, working through the thoughts about what we, we fear everybody else is going to be thinking of us and the, the judgments, right? The fears of failures and all the other things that, that come up when we, I think, are women in these more high performing type roles as well. Yeah, I think it's important that you brought up that aspect of society and like what will other people think? Because, it, you know, it sounds like that was what was leading to those beliefs that you had that was keeping you stuck in those behaviors of like burnout. And like you're saying, 
being more productive rather than taking that time that you needed to um, recharge or like you were referring to. And um, I think I had another guest that spoke about this in the past, like that mix of the masculine versus the feminine, sorry, the masculine versus the feminine energy. Um, I'm curious for you when you say, cause you're referring to this point of burnout that you reached, mm-hmm. um, what did that feel like for you? And how did you know, okay, it's time for me to make a change and what steps did you take? So that's such a great question, Tati, because you know what the reality is? I didn't even in the moment I was actually experiencing the burnout, know I was actually experiencing a burnout. Um, It took like even the day. So I I actually had like a nervous breakdown, which is kind of when I, and it wasn't even in that moment, but I, you know, I had a nervous breakdown and what it was is it got to a point where I couldn't make a decision. So even, even leading up to that, and this is something that I experienced on and off, even several years before this, this kind of point, you know, we were on our honeymoon in Southeast Asia. And because again, this exhaustion, like I was even talking about earlier, you know, we were traveling and I couldn't stay awake. So imagine we're on our honeymoon, we're traveling and I, you know, there were afternoons in the hotel. I just couldn't wake up. I was, again, it was my body telling me that I was exhausted and yet I wasn't letting it recharge. And then, you know, it's, After that, it was, you know, finding myself in these moments of of tears and not knowing I wasn't not knowing what was causing the tear or just an overwhelming feeling, feeling, sorry, that was creeping up on me that led me to tears. I think it was about a week before what I would call the actual burnout. um, I was even shopping. I went to go shopping, like, you know, back to school shopping because my burnout happened like at the very beginning of the school year. I was back to school Mm -hmm. shopping and I walked in the store and the overwhelming of deciding what I wanted to buy, I walked out of the store and I found myself having an anxiety attack. Again, I didn't really realize that this is what I was like having, like when we talk about anxiety attacks or panic attacks, because I never really, apart from that time in 2015, really seen anyone and just thought it was just normal. And so now in hindsight, I see all these warning signs. And then the very morning that I ended up having like the official breakdown I remember I did my workout like I always do, right? Because my workouts help with the anxiety. But yet it got to a point where it's like the workouts weren't working anymore. Despite the workout, it was like I still felt really anxious. And I turned to my husband and I said, I don't feel good. And he goes, when you get to work, you'll be completely fine. Like you're, when you get there, you'll be okay. And so, of course, you know, which usually is right. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to go to work. And I wasn't at work for more than like 10 minutes. And as I was walking down the hallway, a teacher approached me and asked me a really, really simple question, but I couldn't answer it. I couldn't find the answer. And why? Because I had this, this fear of, of giving her the wrong answer and I just couldn't make any decisions anymore. And that's where, you know, that's where I just kind of broke down the pressure of giving her the wrong answer. And so afraid that the, the answer I'd give her wasn't the right one. My body just collapsed. I ended up crying for over two hours. I I was hyperventilating. I had to sit down and like calm myself down. I told my boss, you know, I'm just going to go home. I'll be back tomorrow. And I was off for six months. And, um, and even that, that was a Thursday. And even on the Friday, I thought I just need another day and still thought I was going to go back to work on Monday. And it was actually the Saturday where I was going hiking and we like, Productivity hack is keeping things simple, right? So I have like selected hiking outfits that I, you know, put aside so that I don't have to worry about the decisions I have to make. Mm-hmm. And I had to decide between two shirts to go hiking. And, and again, like that decision, because I had to decide between two shirts, what was the best shirt to make to go hiking. And I broke down deciding what to wear hiking. It was at that moment that I realized that something was wrong because something mm-hmm. that I had, you know, a decision that. I've been making for weeks on end and I even set myself up to, to simplify the decision. I couldn't even in that moment make the decision. And that's when I knew I needed help. And like, this is not right. Like I shouldn't be breaking down like this and leaning into just being aware of the anxiety and my heart just pumping constantly. I had a Fitbit. I would check the, the, um, my heart rate and just all of these things. I just kind of got really, tuned into this. And that's where I, I went and saw the doctor and was like, all right, I guess I need help. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, that's really interesting. So it sounds like you got to the point where your body was so exhausted that even simple things like making small decisions were so incredibly difficult for you. And it was kind of like you're saying that nervous breakdown of like your body and your mind just shutting down. Yeah. And, and it's, and it's, you know, I know I talk a lot about this burnout now, but you know, as you asked about the signs, I mean, the signs were my body speaking to me yet the proudness of not wanting to admit that I was actually experiencing burnout. And a year prior to actual, the breakdown, I actually Googled it because I was curious to know what was a burnout. And I was curious because, you know, again, I would sense going through certain things. And so I actually started Googling the burnout and I kind of felt like, well, I'm not quite there, maybe have some of the signs, but I can, you know, I can course correct. And I think that that's what I noticed with my clients as well is we think we can course correct because we, it's not that we're not capable of being as high achievers, but if we're not given some of the assistance when it comes to actually what's going on in our mind. And as I've learned as a neuro, a neuro coach, you know, we can do all the things like externally, you know, like work on the surface level with the mindset and do all the fitness and, you know, eat healthy and all of those things and the morning routines and, and the gratitude. But if we're not able to actually get to the source of where all this is coming from, you know, I find that you can either prolong the burnout or eventually you can find yourself there because as high achievers, we want big things. And so if our brains are going to keep protecting us from getting there, we're just going to keep doing the hustle and grind and hustle and grind to try to get the results we're looking for. And I think that's where we see a lot of this burnout happening. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like it's that cycle of continuing. Like you mentioned, you were doing those healthy habits that I think a lot of people think you need to do. And of course they're, they're helpful and they're good things to do, but you had mentioned like getting to the source. So what do you mean by that? Understanding the under the underlying thought that's going on an autopilot. So what the big thing that I learned is that 90% of our actions are determined by the these thoughts that are stored in our subconscious mind. And so we're not aware of these subconscious thoughts that are, you know, contributing to all the actions that we're taking. And so when it comes to, you know, making a decision, you know, I couldn't make a decision because I wasn't aware of these, these stories going on internally in my brain subconsciously that led me to believe that, okay, if I made the wrong decision, then it would have all these negative consequences. Um, and it was doing the work and peeling back the layers through therapy, but also as a neuro coach to undercover, why was I so afraid to fail? What would it say about me if I failed, you know, and all of the things that led down to my worth, you know, my worthiness and, and being loved. And a lot of the things that we're not, again, I feel like we're just never taught this in school and we just kind of go on and, and do the things that we do, but getting to the source of what is actually creating the anxiety underneath all the things that we're doing. Mm. Yeah, no, and I think that can be really powerful. And like you said, it's not something that we're taught in school. And you had mentioned this phrase a few times now, neuro coach. Can you describe what that is? Yeah, so being a neuro coach is being able to work with clients. So, and I've um, based on my training, I've, I've developed what I call the achievement mindset method, and it's really the process of taking my clients through to really kind of get to what's the underlying story that keeps coming up for them that has them be af being afraid or of this fear of taking action the to help them get to sort of that next level of success. So I tend to work with a lot of entrepreneurs, but also a lot of females in these leadership roles that, you know, question, you know, the, the imposter syndrome that comes up and working through the imposter syndrome and, and working through needing to say yes to everything, because if I don't say yes, you know, what people are going to think about me and, you know, the people pleasing and all of these things that I find a lot of my clients experience to undercover, why do they feel that they need to be people pleasing? And it's fascinating as we dig deeper through the layers, find out that a lot of the stories that are running on all pilot stem from our childhood, stem from the things that our parents said to us, you know, a really common one that often shows up you know, with, with around parents and families is around 
pleasing. And that's the achievement piece. You know, if I do well, I'm really successful, then I may make my parents happy and then they'll love me. Then it will prevent fighting. You know, I grew up with divorced parents, right? So I realized that that was quite a story that, that sat with me really trying to avoid that my parents were fighting. And so if I did was really, really successful, then they wouldn't fight. And, but I would have never have known that that would be a core story to why, you know, I work so hard was to avoid my parents fighting because there's, you know, there's kind of a disconnect, but it's amazing how our brains will notice things and then, you know, try to save us energy. They just run these stories on, on our autopilot and our subconscious mind. And then it's helping find out what those stories really are and then erasing those stories and writing new stories around success and, and the new story about what success can really mean. And, um, you know, getting to the core of just why people do what they do and helping them see a vision and helping people work through not having to hustle and grind to get the success that they're looking for, but actually get help them kind of program their brain with brain priming to help them get to that success and get to that vision um, in an easy way of doing it versus kind of pushing through that resistance that we often face. Hmm. Yeah. So it sounds like you're referring to identifying like what are those core beliefs that like you're saying are rooted in childhood and maybe from your relationship with your parents or you're referring to like the desire to achieve. And I think like a lot of times your self-worth can be tied into that. Mm -hmm. Um, and then changing those beliefs, like you had mentioned brain priming, what does that mean? Yeah. So brain priming is, is sort of activating the brain and really it, it kind of goes back to that source. So, you know, sometimes a challenge with affirmations is it's very surface level and we'll say things, you know, um, that we really want and, you know, diving into kind of looking at the growth mindset and fixed mindset, which, you know, is a, we see a lot of work out there right now. And I think it's really important for that. We're mindful of what we're saying, but if it's not aligned with actually what's deeper inside of us, the misalignment, we can say the affirmations all that we want, but we'll get frustrated because we're not actually getting that outcome because we haven't been able to dig deeper to what the underlying, like you said, like the core belief or the beliefs that are internally inside of you that have that misalignment. So this is really common with money. You know, if we hear a lot, you know, growing up, like I, you need to work hard for money. And then we're trying to prime that, you know, I can earn money easily. Well, there's a misalignment with that because deep down, you grew up that I need to work hard to earn, you know, to be successful and earn all this money, which means that you're, you're the programming is I need to work, you know, 12 hour days, six days a week, and, and, and that full masculine of productivity, right? Mm -hmm. And on the flip side, if we're saying, you know, we need to rest, and there's power in the pause, and we need to slow down and speed up, there's complete misalignment with that. And so we just end up having the, the fight, because on one hand, you want to work less and achieve more. But yet the belief in you is no, I need to work hard to be successful. And so it's, it's erasing that story and then writing the new story and helping your brain be comfortable with that versus fighting. Yeah. That internal dialogue that we often find ourselves facing with. Yeah. And I think you brought up a lot of great points. Like, I think that is a common belief, like that idea that you need to work hard and struggle to make money. And, you know, for anybody who's in America, I think it can be tied to maybe like the American dream and this idea, like if you just work hard enough, then you'll be successful. Mm -hmm. um, and also like our independent, like focus on independence in, you know, that one person can do whatever it takes to achieve success or make money, whatever it is that your goal is. And I'm curious, like, what would be the process of changing that belief like that you took or that you walk your clients through in trying to identify and rewrite those beliefs like you had said? So sort of, I like to call it like the, you know, when we're trying to live our life, it's kind of the, the building a life by backwards by design. So really looking at, you know, the vision, the outcome that you're working towards and then working back, you know, if we're going to be productive, that means we need to take certain actions and to take the actions, we need to make decisions. And we come back to when we get to the certain decisions that we have to make or the actions that we have to take, that's where we notice that things often come up. I work with a lot of um, business coaches and they've been saying to me lately that, that you know, my clients are doing 75% of the work, but yet they're not doing the last 25%. And they're like, I don't understand. Everything is laid out. 
And it's because the first 75% is comfortable. It's the next 25% that's uncomfortable. And that's where certain stories are coming up. And so it's trying to pinpoint what is it? So a really common example, you know, especially in the entrepreneurial world is, is going live, right? Like going mm-hmm. live in your Facebook and Instagram, you know, connecting with your audience. And yet it's really surprising how the motion of going live for somebody is, makes them feel really uncomfortable. And so being able to identify a certain scenario or situation like going live and then ask, figuring out, well, what's, what's the internal dialogue going on? And so it oftentimes is, is the judgment. Right. Well, I'm afraid if I go live and I share my story, people are going to judge me. Okay. So what is the judgment? What is that story? And it's really, you know, going layer by layer to undercover, where's the judgment coming from? And if I'm judged, you know, people might think, think a certain way about me. Okay. Well, they think, if they think a certain way about you, what does that mean about you? And just kind of going lower, like digging deeper and deeper to uncover internally, what does that link to? And, you know, as we said earlier, you know, often times will lie into this story of of childhood that, um, you know, very common is what parents said about people who were successful, you know, that maybe successful people were, were, were greedy or um, try to think of some other examples that are are coming up here. Um, You know, yeah, I'm, I'm rich money, rich people are evil, the so things like that. And so you realize that the going live is making them feel like people will judge them. But when you peel back all the layers, you can uncover that the idea of going live is the first step and maybe can, making that connection with people, which means then you'll, you know, gain clients that way, which will then lead to your business. But you have this internal story about people that are successful in their business are, are evil or things like that. And so you, you, are able to identify that story and then rework through this process to help them, you know, work through that and change the story and change the dialogue and, and help your brain find evidence that being successful doesn't equal that, you know, that you're an evil person or that you're a bad person mm-hmm. that actually successful people help change the world, you know, and by being successful means that you help your clients, you know, change their lives. And you, there's, it can create this positive ripple effect. We have to create the evidence and show our brains that, you know, that that's, it's a different story and then prime the brain to believe that and then erase that prior story that's been, been programmed in your brain. So I hope, hope that that makes sense. I hope I haven't lost everybody. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think it makes sense to me. So it sounds like you're kind of starting at like the behavior or maybe there's a fear there Mm -hmm. and then looking at like, what is that fear? And like, you're saying, peeling away the layers, like looking um, deeper and asking like, what, um, what is the fear there? Or, you know, like it's, if it's a fear of judgment and then going down to maybe if it's a childhood belief of something you learned from your parents or something that you heard, you know, a lot of times I think it can also come from like coaches or Mm -hmm. teachers Mm -hmm. or, you know, caregivers, if there's somebody else who raised you. Um, so it sounds like a lot of it is rooted in those things that you might learn and experience in childhood that, like you say, go on autopilot. It's mm-hmm. just those repeated patterns throughout your life. Yeah, no, that's exactly it. Right. And, and, and it's always an event that's going to be sort of the trigger. And so it's trying to come up and finding out, you know, a sp- particular event or situation where this, this is happening. And the reality is, as you as you do the work and you uncover, you know, it's like an onion, right? As we peel back one layer, there's another layer, you know, especially as you're up leveling, if you are an entrepreneur and, and you know, you're, you're stepping into unknown territory and our brains are wired to keep us in the safe and familiar. And this is something that I just didn't understand. I mean, as high achievers, we are constantly stepping into new territory. And if our brains are wired to keep us in the safe and familiar related to these, these stories that we grew up with, this is where we're noticing, like when anxiety is creeping up and when, we're feeling this resistance and when we're feeling this uncertainty of needing to make a decision, but when we're able to understand where we want to be going and help our brains get comfortable with that. And that's another part of the brain brain priming process is also looking at your vision and where you want to get to. So yes, write new stories to help the brain get comfortable with the things that you need to do, but also prime it. So you can step into the future version of yourself that can help you get, 
create that vision and have that vision come true. And then there's a lot of other brain things by, you know, with the vision work that you do, you know, activating your reticular activating system. So there's a lot of, that's real. it's, um, it's a simple process, but there's a lot of different brain things that are, you know, to, to work through, you know, to help the brain work for us. Right. And, and not have to really force the whole hustle grind. And I think that's, that's what we see as high achievers. You know, we are very determined individuals and we will, we will keep pushing. I love giving the example. It's like hiking up a mountain with a backpack full of rocks. We're going to get to the top, but we're just going to end up getting there, you know, exhausted and worn out and not even being able to enjoy the view because we're so exhausted or you, you know, can hike a backpack, uh, sorry, a mountain with a backpack full of feathers, which is a lot, you know, you can enjoy the journey and the process. And that's kind of the, um, the process of brain priming and having your brain work for you, not against you, which is, you know, a lot of times we just, we just, we rely on the grit and the resiliency oftentimes to get to the top. And it's not that we're not capable of doing it. It's just that um, what I've learned through my journey is that there's actually an easier way and we don't have to have feel anxious. We, we actually can get rid of the anxiety we can work through a lot of the things that we tend to experience I think as high achievers um we just never learn these things in school we're never taught these things unless you basically probably are heading to a path of burnout or or realize that okay I need to, to make a change we're not necessarily seeking help um and now I've learned like there's just so much I've learned I'm like man I wish I knew this back then you know I just think things would have been so differently and that's why I, personally I'm on a mission to work with high achievers and help them learn about this and help them identify this and, and realize that there's an easier way like we don't have to it doesn't have to be so hard we don't have to work hard to be successful like there is an easier way to do it mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm hearing so that it's like the process of changing your beliefs and thoughts. So like you're saying, you can enjoy the journey rather than like struggling through it. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly it. And I, I wonder, you know, how many women know that, right? Like I said earlier, I honestly sometimes just thought that was just who I was. I just thought like, this is just how I was made. And the struggle was just real. <laughs> and I've learned mm -hmm. that the struggle doesn't have to be real, but I, I don't think that people really te teach us that. And that's why I'm, I'm excited to be able to come on podcast and, and, you know, be able to help educate women to help them understand that, you know, we've been gifted as high achievers with these abilities, um, but that there really is an easier way that we don't have to rely on this, this hustle and grind all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. And I think it's great that you're helping people and high achievers to do that. And, you know, let's say if there's somebody who is struggling with burnout and, um, you know, they're, they're feeling like they might have some of these negative beliefs that are holding them back. Like, what would you suggest? Cause I know that you shared a lot of tips, like where would you suggest they start or that like is the first step that they take? The, the, the best thing to do is become and it, I always call it an investigator. So like, you know, a CSI agent, you know, put your investigator hat on. If you have a booklet or something, you know, even a note section on your phone and just be curious and just make note of, of this. I found that this is probably the hardest thing you'll notice if you feel the anxiety coming up or you're, if you feel the overwhelm creeping in, you'll notice those emotions. And so it's trying to work way, your way backwards. It's like, why, why, what's making me feel overwhelmed or, what is it that's causing the anxiety? And going back to my example of the, the making a decision. Okay. So I can acknowledge that I felt really anxious having to make a decision. Okay. Why, why is making a decision, making me anxious and working back? Okay. Well, I'm afraid to make the wrong choice. Okay. Why am I afraid to make the wrong choice? Well, I'm afraid to make the wrong choice because this person might think this about me. And it's just, it's just kind of asking yourself this question and trying to understand like sort of what's the source? Where's it kind of coming from? And, and yeah, it's just being aware of what's coming up and where it's coming up and, you know, ask yourself, you know, does this tie back to what I was taught in school or something that a caregiver said to me or, you know, what my parents said or the situation, or even, you know, a big one that I, I realized for me was that my, my boss used to say to me that it's, it's lonely at the top. So being a director, you know, it's lonely at the top. And I find this a lot with the women I work with. A lot of times ambitious women, we find ourselves lone, lonely because we oftentimes are just in situations where 
there's not a lot of women like us that we're working with. And so this it was like, as an adult, this became autopilot for me. It's lonely at the top. It's lonely at the top. It's lonely at the top. And so I really felt those lonely at the top. And so because I felt those lonely at the top, I never asked for help because I was, I understood that I wasn't, or the story that I guess I kind of created was I wasn't allowed to ask for help because if I last asked for help, it would make me all these things about me. And so I think that's part of it. It's just being an investigator and be aware and have a way to keep track of this and then just get really, really curious and go back to, you know, yeah, where, where have I heard this before? And what am I afraid of? You know, if people, if I am judged, what, I, what's, what am I afraid of the judgment? And what does it say about me? And if that, and if that was true, what would that say about me? And just kind of get really, really curious about that. So hopefully mm-hmm. that helps. Yeah. I like how you put that being an investigator and being curious and you know, starting with that moment where maybe you're feeling overwhelmed or anxious or like certain emotions are coming up and then like looking backwards and seeing, you know, what's, what's the root of this, like what's leading to this and then how is it tied to your beliefs? Yeah, no, that's exactly it. Great. So, um, would you say, are there any other recommendations that you have when it comes to somebody who sees themselves as, a high achiever and maybe they're struggling with, you know, these feelings of overwhelm and, you know, putting a lot of pressure on themselves and they're struggling with asking for help. When I get, hopefully this is a, a, a one answer. The big, one big thing I found when I felt overwhelmed and this is something now that I, I do now that I didn't do back then is just a brain dump, a simple brain dump. The moment you're feeling overwhelmed, put a brain dump and just put all of your ideas on paper. I think that's the first thing that I found when I, you know, this overwhelm would, would creep in because that is going to help you, I guess, get grounded. The nice thing about writing it all down as well it is a grounding activity. So if you are starting to feel anxious or overwhelmed, you know, having the pen and paper, the, the hand, pen in hand, that kind of piece, just, just get everything down on paper. Cause I, you know, that'll really, really help with the brain. And then really look at everything on paper. Sometimes it's helped then to organize in terms of when are things, you know, when are things due or, you know, are these priorities and and reassessing priorities? I think that's what happens as well as high achievers. We want to do everything. And so we say yes to everything. And so I just getting clarity on where the time is being spent. And a big question I've been asking myself a lot is, am I the best person to do this? You know, when we look at asking for help, I think there's two ways. There's there's asking for help as in being able to delegate and asking someone else to take over it. And, you know, looking at when you are afraid of something, you know, or whether it's asking for help or even taking action, this is a this is a story that I really worked hard on and really reprogramming in my mind was this fear of failure and looking at failure, meaning the first attempt in learning, you know, we try so hard as high achievers to get everything so right and so perfect. And that's why we find ourselves, you know, in these, these loops of procrastination and perfectionism, because we want it to be perfect, because if it's not perfect, again, what are all the stories that are going to come up with that? And so it's, it's being okay with it not being perfect the first time and, and understanding that it's because by doing something for the first time, you're going to learn and it's going to get better. But in order to get better, you've got to actually take action in that. And so I think that that's just that reminder of when you're feeling like that, especially when you can see everything on paper, you can look at, okay, you know, maybe why am I feeling overwhelmed? That is this the first time I'm doing this task and acknowledging that. And then also breaking it down. A lot of times it's just breaking it down. We, we, <laughs> again, as high achievers, we, we tend to bite off more than we can chew in a sort of aspect. And we look at the big project and that's what gets overwhelming. And then, yeah, maybe we don't ask for help because we don't even know what's involved in the process. So again, by getting it down on paper and breaking it up and looking at it, I find that that's also, we feel more empowered to ask for help when we can actually see what the task is broken up. And again, asking yourself, are you the best person to be doing this person? Do you have the skills and knowledge? I think that was something that I got caught up in too. I was too proud. I felt like I needed to know everything. And so I didn't ask for help because I felt like I had to know it all. And just being okay with seeking mentorship, right? Asking someone that you know who's done it before. 
and, and knowing that they'll be able to help you, right? Like there's no, there's no need to reinvent the wheel, especially in this world. Like we're so well, we can get connected so easily. And so, yeah, I think knowing that that can, as you said before, you said earlier today, right, Tassie, like it shows strength to ask for help. And I would just write a lot of these little things down. And obviously I have sticky notes all over my office to remind me these things, because again, mm-hmm. those are not thoughts that are automatic, right? The automatic in our brains is that I need to do it all. I need to prove other people wrong. You know, I need to be in control on all of these things. And so having little sticky notes around the room can really, really help you remember those things in those moments, in those situations. Yeah, I think that's great advice. And it's funny because I do the same thing. I can see sticky notes around me right now (laughs) with like those reminders. I think that can be really helpful. And you had mentioned like making, doing like a brain dump of just kind of getting that stuff out of your head. And I love that question that you said of like, am I the best person to do this? Um, Because I think a lot of times maybe there can be that like pressure to feel like, well, I should be able to do this, but you know, I think should can be like a sticky word that maybe we put tons of pressure on ourselves as high achievers. And, you know, I think reframing it in like, am I the best person to do, to do this? And can somebody else help me with this is, is a great way to look at it. There's such power in the pause. And as high achievers, we just don't, we just tend to not take the time to pause. And I think that's when we get our, find ourselves in these cycles of, you know, I like to call it like just living on autopilot or finding ourselves constantly on the hamster wheel spinning and spinning, you know, and then feeling this pressure of, yeah, I sh- should know the answer. And, you know, why don't I know this? And we tie so much of our worth to our work and we just end up putting so many pressures on ourselves. And we do, we become our, our biggest enemy in a sort of sense because, you know, we set the bar so high And, you know, it's all ruled by ourselves, our own expectations, you know, our own, um, our own standards that we set for ourselves. And sometimes it just takes a second to just pause for a second. I mean, a brain dump really doesn't have to take that long and just asking yourself that question. And, you know, sometimes it, sometimes it is, it's just, I got to put my big girl panties on and just take action, right? Like, you know, just take messy action because that's how you're going to learn and that's how you're going to grow and and that's how you're going to learn for next time. But if we can't see the internal stories that are coming up for us in those moments, I, you know, that's part of the process is being aware of that and then being okay, being okay. Like, you know, progress over perfection. And, and I know I see all these, like, I mean, these are things I literally have been learning over time, but these things that I say are, are the sticky ones that I have around me now, because I really wish I knew this back then. And the one big thing that I know that I didn't do often enough is pause and just take Mm -hmm. a second to breathe and catch my breath and take a second to realign the priorities, ensure that you're spending your time on the most important tasks and having that, that alignment. I think that alignment is really, really key no matter what you're doing. And, And that's where that pause, the brain dump, is able to do a little bit of a self check to make sure that you are, you know, putting all your time and energy in the most important things to move the needle forward on the most important tasks versus doing all the things and, and not having the boundary set it and saying no to things. Right. But when we're not clear of where we're heading, it's hard to, it's hard to do that if we don't have that direction. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I love that the power of the pause, and I'm sure that my listeners can identify with a lot of what you're saying, because it sounds a lot like high functioning anxiety and, Mm -hmm. you know, what I talk about a lot and, you know, that feeling of having that picture of, you know, success and ambition and being hardworking on the outside while on the inside, you're struggling with, you know, anxiety and overthinking and self-doubt because, um, like you're saying, you're not pausing and you're not listening to yourself. So I'm sure that, you know, my listeners could really identify with what you're saying and would find, found a lot of value in, in what you have shared. Well, I know that you have a free gift for them. So can you share what that is? Yeah. So I put together what I call my productivity mastery tips guide, on, in some ways, I, I mean, some of it's stuff that I've been applying for years and other of it's I've updated a lot since going on my own journey. And again, looking at the, uh, you know, the high achiever and what are some things that we can really implement in our days to help us 
in those moments of overwhelm and helping us right, revisit and, and realign and understand where we're, where we're heading, right? Getting clear on the success that we're trying to define. And um, so that's what I put together. Yeah, it's called my productivity master tips. Um, and uh, I think we, we, you have a, a link in the show notes. Yeah. That? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. I'll yeah, put a link in the show notes. Awesome. Mm-hmm. And then of course, you know, on Instagram, I'm always posting different, you know, stories and things to really just as those reminders, a lot of, you know, the quotes I share here today, really, you know, reminding you know, high achievers about that. And then I've also got a Facebook community called Productivity Secrets of High Performing Female Leaders. And I do a live weekly to really, again, drive home some of this stuff because I you know we oftentimes need to hear things more than once for it to, to be, you know, for us to process it, right? Just the way that our, our brain processes things at different times. And so, um, yeah, if you guys want to be a part of that community, I'd love to have you as well to be able to, yeah, share what I like to call Productivity Secrets you know, for high performing female leaders, because I do find that we, um, we need got to stick together and just trying to remind us as high achievers, the, the pressures that we like, we often find ourselves putting on ourselves and, you know, how to, how to navigate when those things do come up. Great. Yeah, no, that sounds like a great community and um, resources that you have. So I'm going to leave links to all of that in the show notes on the podcast or in the YouTube description if you're watching on YouTube. So you shared a lot of information. I'm sure I could talk to you about this all day because this (laughs) is something I'm really interested in myself as well. Um, But thank you so much for being on the podcast. You're welcome, Tati. Can I just share the listeners with my one little message, I guess? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think one of my biggest lessons that I've learned is that, and I guess it is an extension to the power of the pause. As high achievers, we do get wrapped up in just, it's just living, right? We just, we just do, we just do. We go from doing one thing to the next thing to the next thing. And I think when we can take a second to, to pause and, and enjoy the process and the journey, you know, I think what, why we end up reaching the burnout so quickly is that we're so focused on the end goal and the end game that we completely lose sight of the journey. And especially as we know this past year where things have been like very much out of our control, you know, that can put a lot, it can cause, I think even more anxiety and pressure for the high achiever who needs to be in control and really likes to be in control of things. And so by, I guess, learning to, I guess, let up a little bit in a sort of sense and just trying to just stay focused on in the path and where you are currently And that way I think allows you to be okay with things that might happen and might come up that are out of your control and just know and trust that you are exactly where you're meant to be. You know, we always really want to be holding on to that future, but we've seen this past year and a half that, you know, sometimes things really go out of our, out of our control and become very, very unpredictable. So just, yeah, trusting that you are where you're, you're meant to be taking time to pause and just really enjoy the process, enjoy the journey and know that you grow and develop and learn along the way. And that always, that'll influence some of the decisions that you'll, you'll make in the future. And so just to try to try to be, yeah, try to be, I think we're always trying to, we're always in the doing. And I guess it's just try to try to be in those moments. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think that's important. It's, you know, that cliche of like, it's all about the journey, not the destination, but I think, you know, it's a cliche because it's so true. And, you know, that difference, like you're saying of being, I think we're so consumed in like the doing and achieving more, especially as high achievers that it's, it can be so, it seems so simple, but I think sometimes it can be so hard to just be and to just be accepting, but I think it can be really transformational. Yeah. Well, and it is hard, I think, for high achievers. I think that's why I wanted to kind of remind the listeners to, mm-hmm. as much as it might seem challenging, to really try your best, even just for a moment, you know, to just try it to be and just look around and, and get that grounding space. And it can really, really help as well with, with you know, counter that anxiety or overwhelm that might creep in. Great. Thanks so much for sharing that. Is there anything else you wanted to share today? No, well, I think that was it. But thanks, Tati, for having me. And thanks for all the listeners for listening today. I really appreciate it. And, you know, I'm always open if there's other questions or certain topics that, you know, women want me to address. And so I just want to, yeah, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for coming on.